I'm glad to know that I'm kind of adjacent to a TV dinner, which is a conference lunch. So uh, glad you're all able to grab some food and, and sit in on this. Thanks, for your, so, thanks so much for your time. Um, if you're here to learn about GitHub and some of the ways that we are accelerating innovation uh, among our customers with GitHub, then you came to the right place. Uh, so if you sat in Kath's session a few moments ago, I think Kath was really great at delivering um, some of our higher level messaging on how GitHub is involved in the open source community. Um, what this is going to be is a little bit more practical. I'll actually show you some hands on how you can implement um, CI CD with GitHub, GitHub Actions, right, if you're familiar with that feature. And then also uh, we'll talk about some of the security features and what GitHub's doing in that space, how that relates back to the open source community. So I'm Kevin Allwell. Uh, a solutions engineer at GitHub, and I have the privilege of talking to enterprise customers every day about accelerating their ability to deliver high quality and tested features faster. So what I'm gonna share with you is basically an aggregation from those conversations, you know, what we've learned, and, and hopefully there's quite a bit of overlap in kind of your industries and what you all are doing. And I imagine there will be, because some of you are using GitHub either in the open source capacity or you know, in, your, in, in your profession. So before I do that, this will be the first thing we talk about is the most strategic investment that GitHub has ever made is this, uh, this creature here. So raise your hand if you know what species this is. Okay, all right, so I see some hands go up. So this is the Octocat, okay, which is half cat and half octopus. And it's on all of our stickers we give out at these events. Um, you know, GitHub has made a, 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 you know, an enormous investment in this brand, this logo. And if you want to kind of keep me honest on that, you can see this giant bronze statue of the Octocat Mona Lisa in our office in San Francisco with these three great people, right? So there's, <clears throat> so uh, there is a reason behind why GitHub wants to have the Octocat Mona Lisa on the backs of developer laptops and, and the reason we're handing out stickers at all these events, right? And it's because the developer is so important to us. It's really, it's really who we are as an organization. It's a group of people who are working to serve not just the open source community, but the developers that make up that community. And of course, we'll talk about what that means in the enterprise context. So what we understand from the conversations we're having with folks like you is that developers are at the core of innovation inside of your companies. They're going out inside the open source community. They're being exposed to the software, the, you know, the kind of cutting edge technology that's going to help accelerate your software delivery. They're bringing that in and using it uh, to deliver higher quality features. A really interesting statistic that I came across the other day was that um, if you have an application with over a thousand lines of code in it, there's a 99% chance that you're consuming some degree of open source. And so that becomes really interesting when you think about who's actually part of your development teams helping you ship uh, software into production. And it's not just the folks who are kind of button chairs in your offices, right? Or if you're a remote oriented company um, you know, accessing that way. It's also the open source community. And so when you think about it, you have these folks who are contributing and we'll talk about how much that foundation really is in your applications, but they're contributing an enormous amount to your production applications. You have no control over, A, first of all, who they are, and then the workflow from a security perspective. How are you securing those components and ensuring that the open source maintainers are staying abreast of uh, you know, the technology trends? Something that really stood out to me when we start talking about enabling the developer and allowing them to be that source of innovation is this, um, this statistic here. So uh, organizations who have implemented DevOps have a 200 to 400 times sh uh, time shorter time from code to deployment. So what that means is they have a much higher degree of agility, right? Something we do really well at GitHub and that I'm really grateful for as I'm talking to customers is if you're communicating back to me that there's a feature that you want to be native in the platform, we'll bring in the product team, they'll listen to you know, uh, what your technical requirements are and your business justification for having that feature. And we can deliver production features at a really high velocity. I mean, some of our, mo our largest customers who probably are financial institutions like maybe some that you work with or you're a part of, um, have requested features we've been able to deliver very quickly as a result of enabling our developers with DevOps. So uh, I'm going to talk to some of these powerful trends and some more high-level things. And then again, I'll, I'll dive a little bit deeper into some practical ways that you can use GitHub um, with CI, CD, and security. So let's talk about these trends. 
So developers drive innovation inside of your organization. Um, what, we just, what we just mentioned was the open source community, which is very much a part of your, your software supply chain, incorporates those developers, right? So you have uh, this kind of ongoing talent war where you're not able to pull in enough developers to meet your needs so you can ship features like you want to. But the open source community, which has built this foundation, kind of uh, uh, it, it, it makes your team a lot larger than what it actually is, right? Because you have these open source folks who are contributing maybe 80% of your application, that foundation of your, uh, of your software, and your developers are just coming in and doing maybe 10 to 20% of, uh, of of the, de the development, which is, in a large way, just a customization, right? A layer on top of what's already been developed in the open source world. And that's why we see it as being, A, so, so important, and B, really important to understand as an enterprise who's using open source. So we're gonna talk about some of the security implications there and what that security workflow looks like. And it's gonna get, I think, uh, uh, you know, really compelling quickly. So a trend that's not going away that our customers are talking to us about is uh, that cloud enables faster cycles, right? So we start talking about enterprise agility. That's not going away anytime soon uh, uh, in terms of moving from on-prem to the cloud. And in terms of folks actually adopting GitHub in the enterprise space, we're seeing them go uh, a lot more towards the SaaS approach, right? Using GitHub.com where they kind of have this siloed environment for their enterprise to operate in. And that makes them so much closer to those open source maintainers who are delivering 80% of the software in the applications they have in production. So traditionally, the way we think about open source maintainers is really interesting. The, the kind of persona that we've built around them is this isolated person who's sitting in their parents' basement. You know, they're wearing their pajamas. Uh, you know, and you slide pizza under the door, and out comes code, right? High quality and tested code. And so at GitHub, we really do try to challenge that notion because we understand from the relationships we have in the open source community that it's very much, it's an interconnected community. It's people coming together and collaborating in a large way to deliver these, uh, these components that you all rely on every day. So we talked about this in the last session. I'll just get a quick show of hands if, uh, uh, just to get an idea of how familiar you are with the black hole image. How many of you have seen this before? Now everybody has. OK, great. So uh, the Event Horizon team partnered with, uh, you know, uh, who was sitting inside the MIT labs up in, uh, you know, up in uh, the Northeast, partnered with teams all across the US to kind of aggregate these images of computationally what it would be like if you were in New York taking a picture of a single grain of sand in Los Angeles. So if that gives you an, any idea of the scope of computational capacity that they were able to achieve by open sourcing uh, or leveraging the open source community, uh, I think it's really interesting. So here's a list of some of the open source packages that they have incorporated when we looked at those dependencies they were pulling in um, to, their, uh, you know, to the application they, they built. So there were 207 direct contributors on the Event Horizon team, and through those transitive and open source dependencies, there are over 21,000 actual contributors. And so this is really profound in the sense that never before in history has this open source community been centralized on a platform like it is today. So this very well may not have ever been possible, this first ever image of the black hole, without the open source community. So kudos to the folks in the audience who I know are uh, you know, open source maintainers as well. So open source is changing how software is built. 80 to 90% of the code in new applications comes from open source. And so this comes back to, this goes back to the degree of customization and how you're augmenting your developer teams when you bring in and leverage open source inside your organization. So um, what we see here is also this new kind of phrase that I might not have mentioned called inner source. So that is taking open source, which is looking out to the broader community and turning it inwards to the enterprise, right? So um, practicing the reuse of components across your organization where it's possible. So if you're leveraging microservices or you have maybe uh, you know, configurations or pipelines as code that you want to standardize as part of your DevOps journey, inner source is exactly that. So when you see from the pie here what's, which slice and how much that represents for new code, you realize that your developers are really delivering um, you know, a, a much smaller slice of that pie than we realize in terms of lines of code in your production applications. 
So again, just to help understand uh, the breadth of the community that, that kind of lives on GitHub, there's 40 million developers on the platform by 2025. I think that number is going to be something like 100 million. And I think there's a great degree of responsibility that GitHub has to foster that community. And I'll show you in a few moments here some of the features that we're releasing and the workflows that we're talking about internally that uh, help foster that community and keep it safe, not just from an enterprise perspective, but also in the open source world. So uh, you see here some of these names. Uh, these are all among the most innovative companies that have popped up probably within the past 10 years. And in a lot of ways, we've partnered with them to help foster this open source community. I know Facebook is not on here, but if you're familiar with, okay, the, most, uh, the open source projects, GraphQL, they've made enormous contributions in moving the community forward by uh, 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 open sourcing projects that were traditionally only internal to their organization. Okay, so GraphQL started as this kind of side project in Facebook, because when you're scrolling your feed, right, looking for as many in, you know, not interesting things as you can find, um, you want it fast. And so GraphQL enables you to do that with very specific queries. So they were using it internally at Facebook and said, hey, maybe there's some demand for this in the broader community, and we can accelerate our ability to um, you know, deliver a better experience on Facebook by leveraging the contributions from the open source community. So that's kind of a success story in GraphQL. Now one more that I'll mention that you may or may not be familiar with um, is just cloud computing in general. So that actually started, I think, somewhere back in 2008. You're all probably more familiar with it than even I am. But what I thought was interesting about it is that it started as an internal project on, at, a, at Amazon for AWS. And they were serving, this infrastructure team was serving this platform as a service back to internal consumers exclusively. And eventually, they branched that out to their partners. And now, of course, they turn it into the you know, multi-billion dollar industry that it is today. So that started as an inner source project, reusing that code internally and consuming that platform internally. And then it turned into, uh, of course, uh, an entire market for a public cloud. So let's talk a little bit about how GitHub is involved in the DevOps space, helping to accelerate the delivery of secure features faster. So GitHub Actions, um, if, you're all, uh, if you're aware of this feature, that's great. If you're less aware of it, now hopefully uh, you know, I can tell you a few interesting things. Like uh, we, we GA GitHub Actions back at Universe last week. So it is now live. You have an Actions tab available on your repositories or inside your organization, your repos. Uh, you can use Actions for either workflow automation so stringing together your developer tools and creating that automation flow. Maybe you're doing something like, uh, you know, in your planning tools, if you're using JIRA or Azure boards, and you want to create a work item over there as a business analyst and have it reflect back in your repository as an issue, you can orchestrate that as an action. So this is um, a way to create automation in your developer workflows, but also taking it a step further and tying it back to, hey, you know, our enterprise customers came to us and said they love the idea of automation, stringing together their developer tools. What they really want is native CI, CD on GitHub. And so that's exactly what we delivered on last week in the GA. Um, and I'm actually going to walk you through a demonstration of what this looks like when you're running it on GitHub in your repository um, in a few moments here. Something that's really powerful about defining your pipelines as, well, so defining your pipelines as code is obviously a, a very powerful practice and a very healthy practice for a, an organization on the DevOps journey. But uh, something that's really powerful about actions and the open source community is that you can leverage these pipelines as code that other folks have already developed for you. And you just have to do some small degree of customization. right? So if you want to deploy to Azure, if you want to deploy to GCP, you can pull in these pipelines from, uh, or these actions from the broader open source community into your repo or your organization. Just customize them. And you'll be up and running very quickly. So something else I wanted to talk about uh, before I move into actually just a live demo is GitHub package registry. Simply put, this is going to be your artifact repository, scope to your repository on GitHub or your organization. OK, so your binaries will live in here, your build artifacts, your packages will all be scoped to and live in your package registry. So be able to, you'll be able to publish your applications during your, the CD process out to your infrastructure from GitHub package registry. OK, so you can kind of see how we're no longer just this, you know, we are very much aiming to be at the center of your SDLC, of your, of your you know, development life cycle. 
but we're also expanding the scope to, all, you know, to include uh, uh, the CI, CD aspects, so continuously testing and deploying your applications uh, out uh, into whatever, uh, uh, you know, whatever environment it is you're deploying out to and also storing your artifacts. We're gonna have some planning integrations with, uh, with projects, and uh, those integrations are gonna get tighter with our folks, uh, other partners in the ecosystem. Something that naturally comes up when I talk about us expanding our breadth at GitHub is, well, how well do you play with Jenkins? How well do you play with you know, Azure DevOps or Jira? I love those tools. And I think what's been clear to me and to you know, the GitHub community that's been communicated top down is that those integrations are not going away anytime soon. So we'll still have the first class integrations and still allow you to do that best of breed tooling in GitHub, but where we see some features becoming commoditized, like in the CI CD space, we're gonna start to offer those things natively. And so you can leverage them right inside of GitHub. So I'm gonna do a, a quick demo now and actually show you what an action looks like when it's running. Beautiful. Okay, so let's, uh, okay, so this is, if you've never seen it before, uh, hopefully you have, but this is a repository on GitHub that's within one of my, pro with, with, within, within one of our organizations. And so the first thing I'm gonna show you, if you haven't seen it before, because we GA'd last week, is GitHub Actions, right? This tab on the top here, I'll go ahead and click that, and you can also see, uh, you can also see where your packages are scoped right inside of this repository. So that little guy, that tab is gonna pop up now for you as well. So uh, with the first demonstration that I'll show you, is be, it's gonna be really simple. It's gonna cover that use case where maybe I'm a business analyst and in one of your, uh, you know, uh, one of your planning tools and I wanna create a work item there that automatically reflects back as an issue inside of GitHub. And to make it really simple, I'm not gonna open actually any sort of planning tool. I'll just use Postman and show you how you can trigger from any third-party tool an action on your repository in GitHub. So here I am just gonna send a simple API request. That's all I've done. I send an API request, which would be very similar to a webhook event that whatever your third-party tooling is would send off. And so you can see this yellow uh, circle here, the live logs on, on actions show you that uh, the action is now running. It shows you an another piece of information that's really interesting, and you can't see probably from where you are, but um, the event that the action is subscribing to. So of course, when we say it's native in GitHub, we automatically subscribe to the events that the GitHub platform's putting out, right? But also, we can consume external events. So that's what this repository dispatch trigger is. And so we can see that I've triggered on the master branch and what user it's by. So I missed the opportunity to show you the live streaming logs, but I'll show you um, just really quickly what this looks like, the syntax highlighting, um, you know, just a really clean interface that you can search through, you can export these logs as well, and this shows you some of the logic that ran at runtime. So I sent, again, the story is I sent this API request, which would be from your third party tooling, it kicked off an action that creates an issue, okay? So we just created an issue from our action in GitHub. Now if I go into my issues, I'll see not just that I've tested this a few times, but um, that I've created this new issue, I've tagged myself as an assignee, right? You have full access to, to any API from within your action. So that covers the automation use case. If you're looking to automate any of the uh, you know, flows within your SDLC as a developer, but what about CI, CD? So let me show you very simply how you can make a change on GitHub and kick off an action to run your tests continuously. So all I'll do is make a change in my readme file here. I'm just gonna add a smiley face and commit those changes back to this branch. And so again, I'm gonna look for actions and my action should be running here, there it is. Starting to run my workflow. And so in a moment here, I'll see my specs run and, uh, and what's really interesting, if my specs fail on this specific branch, I trigger an external action. So I'm leveraging, again, that open source community that has a collection of actions pre-built that you can just pull in. So if my tests fail, I receive an SMS. I get a text message, or I could also get a voice call saying, hey, you know, your, your tests failed. You probably want to check that, right? If I'm deploying out to my production environment and my tests fail, it just gives me the opportunity to, uh, 
to be notified about that. So I'll see that my test did in fact fail. I received a, a text message. And you saw the logs run in, uh, in real time here. So you can see if you scroll into the logs, you can do your debugging from in here. You can see my tests failed. Uh, and that's CI on GitHub. It's that simple, fully integrated with Actions. In this case, we subscribe to the trigger, which was on push. So when I push some code to a feature branch, I trigger this action, this workflow, and was able to run my CI. So let's go ahead and go back to the deck. Thank you. All right. And we do mean it. Stop by the, stick, the table afterwards for stickers and conversation. You'll get an OctoCat sticker, I promise. We have tons of them. Let's talk about security and compliance, OK? Because securing the software we're pulling into our, uh, our applications from the open source community is obviously very important. And GitHub plays a central role in that, right? <clears throat> so we talk about this concept of shifting security left, right? Ensuring that security engineers, engineers are more tightly ingrained with the development process. Uh, as your developers are writing the code, you have engineers kind of sitting side by side with them, trying to identify vulnerabilities that your developers may be introducing through your open source dependencies or through uh, the code itself, right? And so I think it's broadly understood that you cannot possibly scale a security engineer's time to meet that of, of your developers actually committing changes to your applications, right? So you need to introduce some degree of automation. And just to get an idea of um, you know, the scale of security researchers to professional developers, how many of us are security researchers in the audience at this open source? Oh, we have one over there. Awesome, great. So thank you for being here. Uh, there are 40 million professional developers on GitHub and only 70,000 security re researchers. So that's 570 times the number of, uh, uh, of developers. So Equifax uh, is an interesting story. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm sure you're already familiar with it you know, in, in, to, in some ways. But what's really interesting about the type of vulnerability that was introduced was that it could have been patched if they had just upgraded an open source dependency uh, you know, in one of their underlying packages. And so what we see at GitHub is that it's our responsibility to enable our customers. We're implementing features that enable our customers to, uh, uh, to automatically not just be alerted when, you, you're, when you're potentially introducing a, a vulnerability, but to automatically patch that known vulnerability on GitHub. And so there are these kind of, uh, when you start thinking about how you can secure this, your, your software supply chain from start to finish, you have these four personas. You have security researchers, this nice lady over here. You have open source maintainers. I saw some folks here uh, smiling earlier on. And developers and security teams. right? And it's kind of funny when you think about how that flow works today when there is a vulnerability being introduced in one of your underlying packages, how it gets patched. Okay, and so if you haven't been listening up to this point, this is the part where you could tune in because it's, it's just really kind of eye-opening. So let me walk you through exactly how this happens today, how uh, vulnerabilities are reported on your open source dependencies. So you have security researchers. These folks are looking through uh, your open source packages, or not your open source packages, but they're looking through the open source community trying to identify vulnerabilities in these components, right? So they're doing manual discovery, and trying to, but in most cases, there, in, uh, in hi historically, there was not a way to privately disclose that to open source maintainers. Maybe privately on Twitter or through, uh, you know, if you can get access to them on Facebook, something like that, you could send them a message, right, if you, if you find this vulnerability. And then these maintainers who have full-time jobs, right, they're responsible for acting on and patching that vulnerability that's just been reported by the researcher. So they've been notified, now they have to act on it. And when you think about it, I mean, if my wife, if I'm sending a text message and my wife asks me to take the Thanksgiving turkey out of the oven, you know, there's a very low chance that that turkey is coming out of the oven on time. Similarly, as a maintainer, this is not your full-time job. 
to maintain this open source dependency that you know now has a vulnerability in it. But us as enterprise consumers are pulling in these open source components uh, you know, and using them, uh, just not really understanding possibly what the implications are for that. And so uh, previously when you're updating this, uh, your developers had to go in, look through the NVD, National Vulnerability Database, see that there was a, you know, a, a vulnerability reported there, and they'd have to uh, make the patch manually. And so what GitHub has done in order to alleviate this, this workflow, right, all the pain points along the way in this workflow is a few things. We've enabled security researchers to, or I'm sorry, yeah, so we've enabled security researchers to uh, follow security policies on open source projects to responsibly report when they find a vulnerability privately back to the open source maintainer. And we've also made an acquisition of SEML, which I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, now it's going to be known as uh, uh, GitHub Advanced Security. And so what that allows you to do is it allows you to actually programmatically or automatically scan the code in open source projects or that you're contributing in real time to uh, you know, your applications to see if there are any semantic vulnerabilities that you're introducing. Okay, so that's how we've helped security researchers. Now maintainers, what we do for them, uh, GitHub is now, I think, very excited to say that we are a CVE numbering authority. So what that means is open source maintainers can report first these vulnerabilities to GitHub, who then turns around and plugs them into the National Vulnerability Database. What's, it, what's interesting about that, if you're a GitHub user or an enterprise on GitHub, and you have uh, you know, security alerts enabled on your repos or across your organization, you'll be among the first to be notified, at least, that a vulnerability has been introduced, right? And we do that a couple ways, through the CLI, UI, and, uh, and, and through email. And we can send that directly to your security engineers. So we do CVE issuance. Um, we are going to be the largest vulnerability database for open source projects because of the nature of kind of where we're positioned, right, that the open source community is so prevalent on our platform. Um, and so from a developer's perspective, there's a few things. So first of all, I know myself that, you know, the fact that there's three places that you report vulnerability alerts, that's great, but I'm gonna ignore them in, in four places if you give me three, right? So uh, GitHub did an acquisition back in, uh, it was maybe May, of Dependabot, which is a GitHub app that automatically opens a pull request on your repository if you have a known ver version of an application with an underlying vulnerability. Okay, so we'll automatically patch and help you upgrade the dependencies that you're relying on. And we also introduced, uh, well, we have and, and continue to expand the scope of token scanning. So if you're accidentally, and I know I've made this mistake before, I see some heads nodding. Um, if you're pushing your credentials accidentally into GitHub in a public repo, we'll scan for that and alert the third party service and they'll invalidate that token so that uh, you know, the folks who are, are kind of combing through GitHub can't use them. So de from a dependency insights perspective, we recently shipped um, scope to the organization and actually at the repository level, um, your, an ability to see all open source advisories across your organization. So across all your repos, you can see if you have uh, an underlying package with a vulnerability, and we'll tell you the severity of that vulnerability. Now, what's really interesting about the fact that it's on GitHub, not any other platform that shows you your open source vulnerabilities, is you can trace that, if there is a patch available, you can trace that patch back to the package that's probably on GitHub, to the user who made the patch, probably on GitHub, and you can actually see the code that they used to patch it. So you get a much more granular uh, idea of how these patches are coming to fruition, um, and of course, what the, you know, what the security implications are of your dependencies that you're relying on. So not just, uh, uh, you know, I'll just kind of mention this in passing here, is we don't just tell you about kind of the common vulnerabilities and exposures that have been, um, that have been reported, but also if you have in your dependencies any legal implications from some of the licenses that you're pulling in. As a developer, sometimes we don't know uh, you know, what the implications are of not pulling in an MIT or Apache license, but a GPL license that might say something like, if you consume this package, we, you know, we have some ownership of your code, right? And so we're gonna give you insight into those licenses. Uh, everything that I'm talking about, I should have probably prefaced with this, 
is opt-in, right? So we'll scan your manifest files in your application. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But we'll scan what dependencies you have in that source code and then map that back to any uh, known vulnerabilities. So let's see what this uh, uh, security alerts actually looks like in practice. If I can, uh, you got it. Uh, yes, please, sorry. Yep. So the use case I'm going to walk you through is really simple. I just want to illustrate how security alerts works, how we can automate some of the uh, patching of known vulnerabilities on your applications and make your developers' lives a heck of a lot easier. So you can see in the UI here, I mean, if you're a developer, you're probably going to ignore this box there. But maybe you're a security engineer, and we're talking about shift left, and, you're, and you are scanning through your repositories to see if there are any security alerts. So now all I'd have to do is not go in there and make the change and make the upgrade manually, but just click merge the pull request after I validated that uh, it could be integrated without a regression. So again, here's my repository. Uh, it's just very simply a node app. And there is a security alert on here. So I'm going to go ahead and see the vulnerable dependency that I pulled into my application. So I can see the severity of that vulnerability. And I can see the name of that package. So I pulled in Lodash with a critical severity um, of vulnerability. So I want to go into my insights and under dependency graph. So I had mentioned earlier that we have this concept of the dependency graph scoped in two ways. to your repo and at the higher level, your organization. So as a repo owner, you could see this. And it just gives you some more information about the dependencies and transitive dependencies that you have pulled into your application. So you can see there's a known secure security vulnerability in Lodash. So maybe I don't just want to go view the security alerts. I want to click on possibly, uh, let's see where this takes us. Perfect. So, Here's the security alert in action. This is what your security engineers can use, or your developers can use if they're pat making these patches. You can actually see the CVEs that are associated with this vulnerability. So these have been reported, um, and there's a few of them on here. So if I don't upgrade this, it looks like from 2 version 4.17, I'm going to be vulnerable in these three ways. And so we've automated the patching of those vulnerabilities through this dependabot feature, or this automated security fixes feature as it's being branded now. So you see the bot automatically knew that there was a security alert. It subscribed to that feed and opened a pull request. And again, this is the, one of the interesting things about all this happening on GitHub and not on any other platform, is that you can trace all these patches back to the commits and who made those commits. And you can see the code that they've actually, uh, you know, that they've contributed to patch your vulnerabilities. And so in most cases, not in this case, but it'll give you a compatibility score. So you can see whether or not there's going to be a regression introduced through this, through this patch. And so I can just click Merge Pull Request. I'm a security engineer. I want to patch that vulnerability. And voila, right? My security alert will go away. So if I go back to the deck. So there's uh, you know, one, a, a few other things I wanted to talk about just really quickly. I wanted to talk about GitHub and SAML. So we did an acquisition recently. Some folks have been talking about it outside, which is great. Um, and we're really excited about it. Basically, SAML is being rebranded as GitHub Advanced Security. And the secret sauce of GitHub Advanced Security is code QL. Okay. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to write custom queries on your source code to identify any vulnerabilities semantically that you're introducing as a developer. Okay? And so there's, it's not just that you have to write these queries to find vulnerabilities, but of course, we'll do what most other providers you'd expect that they do, is there's a pool of known vulnerabilities we'll scan for as your developers are pushing their code, but also you can find ones that are maybe specific to your, your organization. If you're deprecating a service, Right? You want to make sure that no one's actually calling out to that service or consuming that service. So you can write queries um, that every time your developer pushes their code, you would scan for that. And so there's a lot of really interesting things uh, that's going on in this space, in the code scanning space at GitHub. If you're interested to learn more, stop by our booth. I'd love to have a conversation with you. 
So again, uh, you can see all of these features that GitHub is investing very heavily in. We understand our position as being kind of the bastions of the open source community. Very fortunate to have that community on there. Um, and we're doing a lot in order to make you the enterprise customer or, or even the open source maintainer or the researcher. We want to make your lives easier. We want to make it a safer place to play and a safer place to consume open source software. So we're no longer just a source code management version control system, right? We still are, are hopefully at the center of, of your development tool chain, where you're storing your code, where you're building your applications, and where that innovation really happens, but we're making investments in the broader SDLC and that broader application lifecycle. So uh, the vision for GitHub is certainly transforming. We're going to stay friendly to our partners in the ecosystem. We're helping you do what you love to do and do so well. Um, and thank you so much for your time.